Aldous Huxley was an English writer and philosopher. He wrote nearly 50 books. And here's his quote about history. That men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons of history. Welcome to the History Slices Podcast. A mother-son duo discussing awesome bits of history. We prove on every show that history is not boring. Entertaining, yet stimulating. This is History Slices. And now, here's your hosts, Jacob and Rachel. Hey, Jacob. Hey, Mom. How's it going? Going pretty great. How's it going with you? It's going really well. I'm super excited to introduce (laughs) your guest host for this episode. Yep. Today, we're trying something a little different, a little fun. Yeah, shaking it up again. Yeah, as we do here. You know, we like to experiment a bit. So we have a guest host today. It's going to be my Uncle David. (laughs) Yeah, Uncle David stepping in the hot seat today. uh, Well, not really the hot, hot seat. You have the hot seat. (laughs) No, no, I'm I'm in the hot seat. He's just in the warm seat. seat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And we're going to be talking about a really fascinating person that just had a really crazy life, but we'll get into that. I am really looking forward to listening in on this, not actually (laughs) participating in it, because I'm going to turn the mic over to David in a minute, but I'm I'm super excited to hear how it goes and learn all about this guy, Mr. Hemingway. Yes. Right on. I'm going to turn the mic over now to David. You guys have a fun time. Cool. Hey, Jacob, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Thank you very much for having me as a guest. This is my chance to go down in history and uh, forever this podcast will be around. So, Well, um, one can only hope. Yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah, don't worry too much. It's pretty casual here. We just talk about fun yeah. historical stuff, um, events or people or whatever. Well, I like your topic too because Ernest Hemingway, you know, uh, it was a uh, required reading for in my generation, anyhow, for lots of lots of high school and junior high school. So I'm a little bit familiar with him. Uh, I wasn't really familiar with his history. I know he's got a fascinating history. Seems like he's been in lots of different places throughout history. Yeah, he got around, that's for yeah. sure. In more ways than one, as you'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't know if it's a generational thing or just I lucked out or unlucked out, I suppose, as it might be. I didn't read any Hemingway in school. I was, my curriculum was more on Fitzgerald and, um, you know, Mark Twain and that type of, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not so much Hemingway. (laughs) Yeah. What made you interested in Hemingway to research? uh, Something must have got on your radar. Yeah. Well, I'm always interested in interesting people and I'm, (laughs) it sounds like a dumb thing to say, but it's true. And I'm interested in writers as well. Uh-huh. Uh, just cause I don't know. I find it fascinating. I find it interesting and each one is different. And usually they put a lot of their own soul as it is into their work. And that's very true for Hemingway as we're going to, as we're going to find out when cool. we dive into it. Well, I'm anxious to hear about it. Awesome. So diving right in Ernest Hemingway, he was born July 1st, 1899 put that into context, you know, for history. Uh, he's from Oak Park, Illinois, which isn't like the most famous place. It's, I think, mainly famous because he was born there. His parents was a doctor by the name of Ed, and his mother is named Grace. See, she's an interesting person. She was a former opera singer, but oh. her career kind of didn't really go that far because of bad eyesight, which is the same, but it happens. So Grace, his mother, she was a bit I don't know if overbearing is the right word, but she was a bit obsessed with her children. You find this a lot with like a lot of um, interesting people. Uh, I don't know how much of the earlier episodes that you've listened to, but we did um, an episode on Vincent van Gogh Mm -hmm. or goth as he's called in the UK. uh, Oh, I see. Yeah. And he had like a similar thing with his folks. Helicopter parents. Yeah, somewhat. Well, Grace, she um, she had Ernest dress as a girl and kind of raised him as a girl until he was like six. Hmm. Which is a little interesting. That is isn't. She must have wanted a, a daughter instead of a son. Potentially. I yeah. don't know. Regardless, his dad, totally against that. Like whenever like he got, because he would take Ernest camping for like two months every year. And there it was hardcore, like, no, we're men. It's masculine. Yeah. We're fisting. We're hunting. That type of stuff. Uh-huh. So it was an interesting upbringing. Despite all that, I'm not sure what he thought of his mother, but later on in life, he would say that he had less than fond memories of his dad just because he was a bit overbearing in like a different way I guess and apparently like beat them when they disobeyed him or something had a temper you know bad parenting 101 (laughs) that stuff like that but when he got older and entered into high school uh, he was pretty popular you know he was uh, very involved in like extracurricular activities and despite 
who he ended up being later on in life and his own claims at the time, he wasn't really all that great at sports. He he talked big, but you know, he wasn't much of a, he exaggerated some stuff, let's say. It wasn't much of a, he wasn't all that, that he made himself out to be. Yeah. And you'll see that he does this several times throughout this, his mm-hmm. life. So I think that's kind of funny. Well, anyways, while he was in high school, it was around this time that people start to notice that he was actually knew how to write. Like he had kind of that, I don't know what you call it, spark or talent or whatever, like, um, he was just naturally good at writing. It's like Al Pacino, you know, they're just good at what they do. And his English teacher, who was the one who kind of first picked up on this, because of course uh, that would be who would, encourage him to like join the school newspaper, Ooh. you know, just to kind of hone that talent and to um, work on it some more. Sure. Yeah, it's, of course, he did join. And the story he first wrote for the paper was, it was a bit of fiction. And it was called uh, Judgment at Manitou. Manitou? I'm not sure how you pronounce that name. I think you say Manitou. Manitou? Yeah. That might be in Canada. It's Uh, very possible. Sounds like a place, Manitou. Oh, I'm sorry. Manitou Springs or something like that. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know. But it was about a uh, hunter who ended up committing suicide, which is a bit dark. Uh, Yeah. For for a high school newspaper? Yeah. But then again, I don't know the times. Maybe that was more so than. So he wasn't writing, he wasn't reporting. Maybe he was reporting too, but he was also adding short stories to the newspaper. Newspaper. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, well, he eventually did get into more journalistic stuff, as we'll find out. But that was kind of like the, I don't know if I call it the talk of the town, but people were like, oh, this is really good. And he's like, oh, cool. And it kind of influenced him to get more into journalism, which was against what his dad wanted him to be. His dad wanted him to be a doctor, which is what he was, you know. Um, but Ernest wasn't that type of person, you know. It's happened sometimes. Sure. So he had an uncle that worked for the Kansas City Star, which is a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And thanks to that, he got a internship as a reporter. So he's around 17 at this point. And he's writing about like stories relating to crime, you know, like, um, I don't know, like how serious crimes probably just kind of average like theft violence, whatever, you know, and that happened for a little bit. And then 1917 rolled around. I don't know if you know of any significant event that happens in 1917. Isn't that when, right around when World War One started? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so he was 18 if he was born in 1899, 19, 18 years old. Yeah. Around mm-hmm. that. So America enters the war and Hemingway tried to join the army because he thought, oh, cool. You know, he wanted to get a bit of that accent. Sure. And yeah. which is, it was pretty typical at the time. A lot of younger men were in the same boat because there was a surge in patriotic fervor, you know? Mm-hmm. And also, this is still at a time when war was not considered glamorous, but it was seen as more of a kind of honorable adventure thing. Yeah. Uh, a lot of glory. Yeah. Um, Order One, the trenches and... Just the terribleness of that kind of put a put a stop to that. But for a lot of countries in Europe and elsewhere, war was still considered like a um, not a completely horrible thing. It's considered now just because, you know, World War one was that bad. <laughs> I don't know if it's a genetic thing, but like his mother, he didn't have great vision either. So he was denied entrance into, you know, the army he wasn't allowed. Because of his vision, you said? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Like his mom couldn't sing opera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know why you need vision necessary to sing opera, but I guess well, you do. Maybe you need to read the music or something. Maybe, notes, yeah. You know? That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, sorry, I, I digress. So he had bad vision. He couldn't get in. He couldn't join the service. Yeah, it was. Or he couldn't be infantry. Sir, he wasn't yeah. cutting it. So he tried again with the Red Cross Ambulance Division in Italy, which his application at that time was accepted. Uh, so he was like, cool. So he sipped off to Europe. Technically not what he wanted because it wasn't like front lines fighting, you know, and all that. But it was still involved, yeah. you know. Got his foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. And from his accounts, he really enjoyed his time in Italy. Uh, he did a lot of drinking. He did a lot of gambling. Uh, he made a lot of friends there, you know, guy stuff. He really wanted to see combat, though, which, of course, his position in that place at that time wasn't really combat heavy. That changed in July 18th, 1918, however. 
uh, he was delivering supplies, quote unquote, it was cigarettes and chocolate, but you know, <laughs> supplies. I consider that supplies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so to some Italian soldiers on the Pave, Pieve River, I'm not sure it's an Italian name. There's a sudden kind of German attack, like a skirmish happened. Uh, that was unexpected, I suppose. A bomb went off near him. Uh, it threw him to the ground. He got some shrapnel in his leg, which sucks. And the soldier next to him actually got killed from the bomb. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and that's war for you. But despite his injury, he still managed to, like, carry another wounded soldier to safety and stuff. You know, very heroic. But in a bit of an irony, afterwards, he became a patient at the Red Cross place instead of a like oh, an employee yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So was he exaggerating about, uh, was this verified that he did, he was that heroic and saved him? Or was it like him playing sports in high school where yeah. he embellished it himself? I think it was uh, confirmed, but he uh, said a lot of other stuff that he did during this time that isn't confirmed. And in fact, some of it is like the opposite is confirmed. So interesting. Yeah. Well, it was here that he fell in love with a nurse by the name of um, Agnes von Kurowski. I believe is how you say her name. He had a bit of a lady trouble, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. He this happened a lot, but we'll get into that. Um, he was a player. Yeah, he was a player. He was apparently very charming because he kept getting away with it. Uh, <laughs> they hit it off, and while he was recovering from his injuries, they kind of went around, uh, not really touring, but you know, just kind of seeing the sights on uh, Milan, which is where they were, it's an Italian city. They're basically going on dates, you know. And C agreed to, it got to a point where she agreed to marry him once the war was over. He was discharged from Red Cross and returned home in Oak Park on New Year's Eve, 1918. And there he told a local paper all about him being a brave soldier in the Italian army. The Italian king personally awarded him uh, for his bravery. None of that was true. That was just him puffing up his chest, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfortunately, this was around the time Agnes broke up with him via letter, which kind of sucks. Oh, yeah. It's like uh, like breaking up with someone over a, a text. Text, yeah. text message. This days would probably be text message. Sure. I mean, I don't know. It's possible she just couldn't make it to wherever he was. She had issues with the AIDS gap between the two. She well, was, was older. Eight, eight years or seven years, you said? Yeah. Uh, she was seven years older than him. Uh-huh. She just thought he was too young for her, I suppose. Fair enough, I yeah, guess. Yeah, sure, yeah. Big uh, difference. He, he was 1920. She was 27, 28. Yeah. Guys don't really mature until they're, you know, mm-hmm. become a young man. Until I mean, people don't fully mature until they're like in their mid 20s or yeah, so, you know. Right. So, yeah. In hindsight, I think it was probably a rash decision. <laughs> but that's how it goes. So, but that, her breaking up with him really kind of messed up his mood, messed up his funk, you know. Uh, he was kind of moping around the house for like months on end. And eventually his mom got sick and tired of him. This unemployed loaf of a son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, moping about a girl. So she kicked him out. We're not really sure if this was what kind of snapped him out of his uh, slump or if it was like there's some other factor. But regardless, he's like, OK, I'm going to try to do something with my life, basically. So he goes to Chicago and he begins writing articles for the Toronto Star, which is in our newspaper. He does a lot of newspaper work and as well as doing other random odd jobs just to kind of cruise on, you know, mm-hmm. uh, one night. At a party, he met uh, Haley Richardson, who was at the time visiting from St. Louis. She was another older woman, uh, eight years a senior, and they hit it off. They, uh, I don't know if he had a type for older women or if this was just a coincidence. Sounds like like slightly older women. Sir. Maybe because they had more money, they had some money or means or access to money, maybe. Yeah. Regardless, they married nine months later in 1921. So I don't know if nine months is considered like a rural win romance, but it's interesting. They had a writer friend because, of course, he was involved in kind of the writing scene. You know, he had some friends who also wrote, you know, and a friend of theirs encouraged them to move to Paris. He actually gave them like um, some contacts of his that were in Paris at the time. Oh, wow. Like, you know, hey, I know some people. They're cool. You know, here's. Yeah, so was this. So was, what year was this? 1921. So this was, was, was the, the early was 20s. World War One done by then? Yes, it, it, was, had, okay. it had finished by now. Yeah. So Hemingway, who was now a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star, he's like, cool, I'll go go to Paris. So him and uh, the missus, <laughs> they left for Europe. 
as a reoccurring theme in the story is that they hop around a lot on the map. They do a lot of traveling, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. So they moved into a small flat that was next to a dance hall. I think it was a relatively popular dance hall at the time. Um, it might still be. I don't know. I've never been to Paris. Uh, he also rented another room on top of a hotel where he spent his mornings writing. He had like a very strict uh, writing schedule. Like, you know, some writers are like that. Some are very chill, where it's just like whenever the mood strikes them and then they write out gold, you know, but right. others are very much like, no, I have to write every day. Structured. Uh, at this particular time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. If you feel like it or not, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what he was on, he, he had a schedule for himself. Yeah. And he'd stick to it yeah he'd like write in the mornings basically was he writing novels at this point or was he still he had recording? A, he hasn't written any novels yet i think it was when it wasn't newspaper job related stuff it was probably the short stories or just experimental like just non-publicable just practice writing basically which is what i do a lot of time is this i'm like just trying to get the hang of it regardless he quickly kind of entered a literary scene there, you know? He befriended a lot of local writers and other people who were into that and, like, kind of traveled the city, visiting all these sites and basically looking for inspiration for his works, you know? He would absorb people in cafes. He just talked to random strangers randomly. <laughs> you know, it was very upfront and, um, I don't know if friendly is the right word, but... Outgoing. Outgoing. Yeah, he wasn't a shy person. And he's still in France at this point. Yeah, he's, he's still in, in Paris. in Paris, yeah. yeah. He drank a lot with, like, his buddies. He loved to drink. Yeah. It probably... helps to meet people, too, especially if you... I imagine he was trying to learn French and, you know... <laughs> yeah. You get a little buzz on, you think you... You know, you can start learning languages or you think <laughs> people can understand you. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, he was basically looking to life for inspiration, which is interesting. Um, not every writer does that, but it's interesting when you find one that does. So while in Paris, Ernest met Gertrude Stein, who was a pretty well-known author, playwright. She was pretty celebrated. She actually kind of took him on his ruin a little bit and gave him some pointers, gave him some like advice on how to... Not how to write, but kind of how to develop your style. And it was there that he began his, I don't know if he called it this at the time, but his iceberg theory, which what that was is basically a minimalist writing where it was like, you tell a lot by telling very little kind of, yeah. Cause it's like an iceberg. You see a little bit on the surface, but underneath it's a lot bigger. I assume that's like the idea behind it, but that's like his identifiable as his style of writing, like. To the point where uh, there's a very famous story. We don't know if it's true or not. We're not sure if he's the one who came up with this or if it was someone else. Where uh, he, as part of a bet, made a six-word story <laughs> called, yeah. um, it was uh, For Sale, Baby Sue's Never Worn. It's like, oh, geez, like, that's a dark yeah. story. But it's only six words. Yeah, It just applies a lot. Uh, we're not entirely sure if he wrote that or if it was someone else who came up with it. But, yeah. You well, know. That, that style, I mean, certainly some of his stories, the, the ones I've read, uh, very short stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it wasn't, you know, the, the book was probably an inch thick or inch and a half thick, not a big yeah. 600 page book, you know. Yeah. So, which is why I think it was that style. Minimalist is he's easy to read and, and uh, kind of left a lot up to the imagination of the reader. Yeah. Rather than going into detail, every little last detail about everything, he kind of just wrote the basics and, and let the reader fill in the blanks or imagine what was going on. So. Sure. Yeah. It's still a theme, too. Like some people I've seen on Twitter, because uh, you're only allowed a certain number of characters on Twitter, mm-hmm. they will write stories within like that limit. Oh, wow. It's just like little, little <laughs> like tweets that are like mini stories. Oh, I'm like, cool. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. People are creative. I yeah, love it. Oh, yeah. Anyways, so 1923 is rolled around. Him and his wife are visiting Spain. I'm not sure why. Could have been a vacation or something. But Hemingway became fascinated with Spanish culture and people. He was really interested in it, especially bullfighting. He thought bullfighting was awesome. He loved it. And it, this interest would last for years. He would later visit Spain multiple times and bring other friends. And they would watch like the running of the bulls and stuff like that. Which, I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, Pamplona. Yeah, in Pamplona. Yeah, where they basically let the bulls loose in the streets. And yeah. then, like it chase people. Seems a bit dangerous, but whatever. Culture is culture, I suppose. But it inspired his first novel, which uh, The Sun Also Rises. 
which uh, he published a couple years later in 1926. It was kind of like his breakthrough. Like people started to take notice of this guy because before he wasn't really a, a, a name, you know, he was just a guy. But after that, they're like, oh, hey, this is a cool book. You know, critics really liked it. It sold a lot. So it was like kind of a... Um, Kind of his first success story, I guess you can say. And it was also very much, I don't know if autobiographical is the right word. It was it was about a person visiting Spain and watching bullfightings. And <laughs> so he was inspired because he visits Spain and watched bullfightings. You yeah. know, it's like Sounds very kind of autobiographical. Yeah, very straightforward <laughs> about yeah. like, you know, what it's about, <laughs> who's it about. But yeah, unfortunately, while he had some success like in the... um career department you know in the ryan department his personal life kind of began to suffer a bit one of the reasons was his temper he get into his fights a lot you know he would uh get i think offended a lot or angry a lot and that alienated a lot of his drinking buddies and his friends because they're like well this guy's not that fun to hang out with because he's a crazy drunk (laughs) and he also ended up in an affair with a friend's wife named uh, pauline pfeiffer i believe that's how you say her last name Hadley found out because I don't think he was all that good at hiding it, but C was pretty upset. C felt betrayed about all this and C gave him a hundred days to decide who he want to be with. And he's like, okay, well I'll be with the mistress. Oh, just so straight up yeah. left her. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they, uh, they didn't have kids or anything. I think they had a son. They had one son. Yeah. But I couldn't find too much information uh-huh. in that department. So, the same year he marries Pauline, because of course he does, because why not? And the two of them leave Paris and move to Key West in Florida. He kind of, I don't know if reinvent is the right term, but he kind of takes on a new persona. He started a new career as a deep sea fisherman, basically. He was apparently really interested in this. Uh, he loved to fist, like big deep sea fists. I don't know what you call them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he liked kind of the rough and tumble lifestyle and he liked the people that was associated with that profession. Mm-hmm. It was very different than kind of what he was doing beforehand, you know, because beforehand in Paris, he hung out with writers and intellectuals and not rough and tumble sailor fisherman people, which is who he was hanging out with now. Yeah. Yeah, that move is interesting from Paris to Key West. It's to- two totally different cultures. Yeah. Kind of. If he was in uh, Paris and then or France and then Spain, that's European. Yeah. Key West back then must have just been a you know, small fishing town that probably had more to do with Cuba, but just because of its proximity to it. Yeah, well, he, he was very connected to Cuba or became very connected. Uh, he would fish along the Cuban coast a lot. And they knew him there, like in Havana and stuff, because he kept visiting all the bars and stuff. He wrote another novel around this time called A Farewell to Arms, which is basically a fictional retelling of his time during World War II. And it was a pretty good success. It got more money. He was still earning proceeds from his first book. So this kind of just added to that. And with the new money, he built a boat himself, which he named a pillar. I don't know why. Pilar, maybe. Pilar, maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, and he entered a number of fishing contests that were in the area. He actually won a lot, uh, got some trophies for it, upset some of the locals. I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, maybe because they just lived there longer than he did. And he's just come in and won all the stuff. And he made them a deal. He's like, if he can last three rounds with me in a boxing ring, I'll give you, you can have the trophies back. And none of them could because he was a big, tough dude. <laughs> yeah. Half drunk, sounds like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did w- that first book, was it a commercial success? Was it, it was. That was the, the Sun Also Rises? Yeah, yeah. yeah it so was, he, he made enough money on that that he could survive. So the fishing was just kind of a hobby for him? It or? was just kind of like a... Like like a passion thing where uh-huh. so it was just like that was the type of person he wanted to be. I see. Um, I see. And he kept up his schedule too. Like he never stopped writing throughout all this. Uh, what he would do is he would wake up five in the morning, right into lunch, basically uh-huh. the whole morning's writing. After that, he would just go out and be a fisherman uh-huh. and kind of wow. be like, like drink a lot, you know, hang out with the, with the guys, you know, just, he had like his two love interests, if you can call it that, like divided at lunchtime. That's kind of how he did it. Interesting. Yeah, he's a very interesting person. Uh, he ended up having two sons with Pauline, though the two of them weren't very good at being parents. Pauline was kind of not very interested in children, I don't think. And Ernest would fluctuate between being really, giving them a lot of attention and being really like interested in them and forgetting they existed. Like not really give, giving them the time of day at all. I'm not sure why. I think it was just because who he was as a person. 
1933, he goes on a hunting safari in Africa. I don't know why. I don't know the context, but he goes on a hunting safari and he finds um, a new love in it. He loves it. He's like, he thinks the um, landscape is beautiful. He loves the nature, all that in the Serengeti plane. He was just like, this is, this is dope. This is awesome. He sounds like quite the, the traveler because back then there was no airplanes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to take ships everywhere you went. So, I mean, I don't know how long it takes to get from, from Florida to Africa, but you got to imagine a couple of weeks. So At he, least, he must yeah. be quite the traveler and explorer. Right? Uh, yeah, he... Well, researching him, I got the distinct impression, and I don't know the guy. I got the distinct impression that he was very adventurous and very mm -hmm. uh, craving of adventure and yeah. new stuff. Yeah, that's that's really. It almost sounds like he sought out adventure just so he could have something to write about. You know, and, and honestly, so. not too far off from like <laughs> from the mark. I yeah. feel like now, uh, unfortunately, he ended up getting dysentery while in Africa, oh, yeah. which sucks. That happens. Yeah, so he was flown to Nairobi to a hospital to recover and while they flew there they flew over mount kilimanjaro which is a um a mountain in the area and that i don't know if it was a site or whatever he thought it was very beautiful when they passed by it and he ended up writing a short story called the snows of kilimanjaro kind of based off like this this location and critics liked it. They're like, Oh, this is great. So he's, he's sending pretty, 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 you know, mm -hmm. in terms of like uh success. Yeah. Um, so he recovers dysentery. He went back to his safari because he's not a type of person to like, let that stop him. And he had a pretty successful outing. He got some Buffalo, some antelope lions, the works, you know, and all this time just gained more inspiration for his books. He eventually began an air fair. <laughs> he can't keep getting away from this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no. This time with a, a lady in Havana. And he's still married. He's still married. This is he's on his second wife, who he initially had an affair with. Now he's having another affair with yeah. some other lady. And these are just the affairs we know about because he decided to marry him. Or uh, yeah. To, yeah. To, no, basically. Know. So he spent a lot of time with his mistress in Cuba leaving his increasingly frustrated wife to care for their sons and um, Key West. I'm pretty sure he knew. Like, I don't think he either didn't make much of an attempt to hide it or he was just bad at hiding it because, like, all of his wives, you'll find out, eventually find out that he's cheating on them. I'm not sure what happened to that particular affair. It might just petered out. Regardless, in 936, he began yet another affair with a journalist by the name of uh, Martha Gilhorn. So, 937. Both Hemingway and Gilhorn have a great interest in journalism because that's kind of where their fields lied. And the Spanish Civil War was going on, so they decided to go over there and cover it. Uh, Hemingway had already been to Spain. He, you know, had an interest in the area. So he went there as a reporter for Alliance, which is or was an American newspaper. I don't think it's still around. It might be. And while there... He kind of got, I don't know if sidetracks is the right word. He got involved with a movie that they were making there called um, The Spanish Earth. It was like a Dutch film. And what happened was the screenwriter for this movie quit in the middle of it. And Hemingway just kind of stepped in. Oh, and right place at the right time. I guess. I mean, I don't think he wrote any scripts before that or was a screenwriter before that. So it was just kind of a strange stars aligned weird situation. But a few months later, after the movie was finished, he came home, he sold the film in Hollywood, which people liked. They're like, oh, okay, cool. And he raised uh, $20,000 for the Spanish Republicans. Wow. Um, yeah. Man, back then, that was a that was a good sum of money back then. Yeah, yeah, that was a pretty... And so he donated it to the, yeah, the Republican he, cause, the Spanish Republican cause. Yeah, he basically... Um, I don't know if charity is the right word, but he basically like uh, donated. fundraised. Yeah, yeah. Done, donated, yeah. Right. Wow, he must have felt real strongly about their cause. Apparently, yeah. While in Spain, he wrote For Whom the Bell Toils, which is was his third novel. And most people, it was a big success then. Nowadays, it's considered like one of his masterpieces. Right up there with uh, The Old Man and the Sea, which we'll get to. Uh, it's like considered like one of his best works. Has even adapted for film and television a few times since it came out. That I haven't seen any of those, so I can't remark on quality or lack thereof. Regardless, after the whole, you know, he was done in Spain, after that whole time of his life, he went to Key West, divorced his wife again, 
and married his mistress again. Uh, <laughs> I've seen a pattern. Yes, yes. He is a man of uh, habit. Yeah. Um, so in 39, he finally moved to Cuba, like, it's a straight up, like, because he's already spent a lot of his time there, so it makes sense. He got a villa on the outskirts of Havana. I don't know why I said it like that. I don't know. Don't worry. <laughs> Havana? Havana. Havana. I'm not sorry yeah, I pronounce it. Yeah, that's, the, I understand. That's right. how you say it. Okay, cool. Havana. Good. He continued to, you know, continue to deep sea fish, continue to write, basically carrying on as he had been doing. Though this time, the difference was his wife was also a writer. So that was kind of like, that was kind of nice because they had a bit of a shared interest there. When hurricane season hit Cuba, he decided to relocate to Idaho. He still kept his property in Cuba, but he got a new place in Sun Valley up wow. in Idaho, wow. which is pretty removed. Uh, yeah, that's what he keeps going in uh, yeah. different directions. Uh, yeah. But all cool places. What did you say, Sun River? Uh, Sun Valley. Oh, Sun Valley. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, wow, interesting. Yeah. Which is, these days, I think, is a kind of a resort town up in Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, is it? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Well, it was around this point that he became good friends with Gary Cooper and um, Malene Dietrich, which I don't know if you know those names. They were very famous actors at the time. And this kind of led to, I mean, he was already a known person because he'd written like some successful novels. But this was like a um, kind of opened up the floodgates, so to speak, in him entering like a ring of celebrity friends. You know, Jane Russell, Spencer Tracy, Ingrid Bergman, Errol Flynn. Even like the Duchess of Windsor from like the UK, <laughs> you know, he, he entertained them uh, in his place in Idaho. And uh, he kind of was a bit of a celebrity himself at that point, if he wasn't already. But he still was hung out in Havana a lot. They loved him there because of his fame and also just because of his um, personality. So this is 39. Is that what you said? It's around 39, so yeah. So I'm just trying to put his age. So Late 30s, early 40s. 41. Yeah, if he was born in 90, 1899. Okay. Just yeah. Curious. And he kept writing throughout all of this, which I think is very admirable, regardless of his uh, infidelity. Yeah. <laughs> He's very, um, it was very, that's the right word for it, not determined, um, disciplined, I guess, in terms of his craft. Uh, not, not so much his love life, but yeah, you know, whatever. Wow. No, no one's perfect, I suppose. So World War II kicked off, you know, and Gilhorn, C was very much... She liked the ally, uh, the allies. She thought it was a very noble cause. So she went to Europe as a war correspondent, and she was really urging Ernest to kind of use his fame to rally up support for the ally causes. Now, or cause. Now, keep in mind, and at this time, America was not really in the war. We had just gone out of like the Great Depression. and we just gone out of World War One. So it was kind of common public sentiment that we don't want to get involved. This is a European affair. Right. Not our, you know, not our business. Isolationist, I think. Is what yeah. Um, FDR, who was president at the time, favored the Allies and wanted to jump in the ring, but because of um, press, or he couldn't really do so. So he sent in a lot of supplies and I think maybe volunteers, but nothing like no official declarations or anything like that. It wasn't until Pearl Harbor that was enough of a uh, cause that people were like, oh, how dare they, you know. That's a whole thing. Ernest Hemingway was really upset by his wife going to Europe because he thought he accused her of putting her career in front of her family, which is rich coming from him. But I digress. <laughs> but eventually he himself would become a correspondent for Collier's magazine and he ended up joining the RAF for bombing missions. He reported on the uh, 4th Infantry as they went across Normandy uh, during like D-Day or after D-Day, however. After the war ended, he went back to his old tricks and greatly exaggerated his his role, basically, in the uh, in the war. Uh, unfortunately for him, this time the military caught wind of what he was saying, probably because he was more famous. <laughs> and oh, yeah, they, sure. they did some more digging. They're like, hmm, that doesn't sound right. So they did some digging, and what they found was that he, because he was a non-combative reporter, and he had violated a lot of his kind of like what you can and can't do as a reporter there. I couldn't find too much details on that. It sounded like he got into a fight with someone or something like that. But he was basically charged with being a rule breaker, you know. <laughs> uh, but to his defense, a lot of high-ranking officers came up to testify. They said he's a very brave man, you know. You know, he's didn't mean any harm. He was a you know, badass, basically. And uh, <laughs> the military's like, okay, all right. Well, what's the consensus then? Was he actually, instead of just reporting, he was out there fighting? And uh, Well, that's... 
I think that's kind of what he ended up doing. Yeah. Uh, uh, because at, uh, in the First World War, he never really got to see combat, and yeah. he wanted to. And I think, yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, I think he was just trying to scratch that its, I guess. Yeah, right, right. Uh, check it off the list. and Sure, you know, yeah. He, he liked to tell stories. I'm sure he liked to embellish himself. So oh, he, yeah. He wanted that feather in his hat, uh, mm-hmm. probably. I'm sure, yeah. But he got backed up, so there were some generals. People, yeah, some of the uh, officers liked him. They thought he was a cool guy. Right. But and, he must have done, uh, I mean, because coming from the military, the, the whole stolen valor thing, mm-hmm. they're not going to vouch for him if you didn't do it. So he yeah. must have you know, he played actually some got kind a, of role uh, apart from reporting. Yeah, he actually got a bronze star for bravery Is that so right? wow he yeah, yeah so okay. he did something i'm not i couldn't he find too much yeah. details on that oh. regardless so after the war ended he found himself single again gilhorn his current wife left him this time instead of him leaving his wife because he was fed up with him just cheating on all on her all the time <laughs> fair enough but that didn't last too long because he already had a mistress that he had picked up during the war um a woman named mary wells oh my gosh this was the another, third the third fourth wife slash mistress or? yeah something like that yeah, i've lost count so yeah was, he was another uh war correspondent i know it's ridiculous yeah. like this, this he needs to learn to uh, yeah. Keep it in his pants because yeah. it's too yeah. it's too yeah. much. Well, um, he's a, f- a famous guy. I'm sure I he. Guess. I'm sure yeah. he, he had lots of women interested in him. You know? I suppose he was a handsome guy. If you've ever seen mm-hmm. pictures, you know he was. No, he was probably wealthy from all his success as yeah. a writer. And he was even when he was older, he was good looking. Yeah. So yeah. By the late forties, his physical and mental health began to fail, probably because he spent his entire life drinking ma- <laughs> like heavy amounts. But this ended up leading to his writing losing some of its quality because you know, health problems and stuff. Of course. So after a trip to Italy where he had another affair, oh, this time with a, a girl in her 20s, which is not cool, I don't think. Yeah, because uh, he's... He's old or... Uh, almost 50 by now. Yeah. Uh, he published uh, the novel Across the River and Into the Trees, which was a bestseller, but critics tore to shreds. They hated it. Uh, I think one even said that, like, this book makes me cry, not because of its content, but because of... How much it does it live up to his potential, his, potential, his uh, hype, you know, yeah, at this point. Yeah. It's worth noting that later critics, you know, like more recent ones, upon real evaluation are more forgiving of it, probably because they understand or are aware more of the circumstances in his life, but also because of, um, I think one of them said that, like, if it hadn't been Hemingway, it wouldn't have gotten so much negative press because a brand recognition. Like, sure. it's it's an okay book. Right, <laughs> I right. never read it, but... Well, I, people like to tear people down, too. Oh, you know, yeah. Like, especially if you're successful. Oh, yeah. Uh, they thrive on negativity. Yeah, yeah. But regardless, it was a uh, it was a wake-up call for him, and he fits his next novel in just eight weeks, which is insane. Sane, if you've ever tried to write anything. So was that, that was when he wrote The Old Man in the Sea? Yeah. Was he in, where was he at this point in time? Was he in Cuba or, because uh, uh, isn't that a, uh, the theme on that Old Man in the Sea is a fishing novel, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if he was in Cuba at the time or Idaho. Um, uh-huh. I think he still had. Some experiences he wanted to write about probably. Yeah. It's arguably his most famous work. It actually won him the 1953 Pulitzer Prize for literature. So, which is crazy. He got on the cover of Life magazine. It was like a whole thing. And it kind of was a return of form. It was kind of a a set up to the critics of his his last one. We're nearing the end of his life at this point. In 1954, he was on a safari in Africa, a separate one. And his plane, it wasn't a large plane. It was like a light kind of plane. It went down. He saved the lives of the passengers, but ended up banging his head on the door to try and open it, uh-huh. and that caused permanent head injury. Oh. So that's not great. And then um, in 1960, after the Cuban Revolution, the Hemingways were among those that kind of got the hell out of Dodds, you know, and kind of permanently settled in Idaho. So they must have kept their place in Cuba then. Yeah, and they uh, kind of settled in Idaho, but his mental and physical health just plummeted. He... I guess because this is at a time when they didn't really know how to handle depression. They tried to cure it with electroshock therapy, which obviously didn't work. Mm-hmm. It really messed up his memory and therefore his ability to write because he relied on his memory to write, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, right. So it didn't help his depression. And that was like his whole life basically was writing. So really tragically, on July 2nd, 1961, he took his favorite hunting rifle and he committed suicide in his home, mm. which is very tragic, very sad, and... 
I don't know. And it kind of just ends, which is a bit of a downer, but that's life for you. You know, it's not a very good story, real life, because significant characters die yeah. unceremoniously. Oh boy, he sure lived an interesting life. I know. I that's mean, why I wanted... All the places he went to, and like I said before, back then, it wasn't as easy as just hopping on a plane and you're mm-hmm. there in six hours. It took a little bit more planning, a little bit more time. and Yeah. I mean, he's such a fascinating person. Like, even putting aside his writing, which is very good and very, I think, significant, even putting aside that him as a person is very interesting um, and very fascinating, which you don't often get, you yeah. know, sometimes you'll have someone who has done something that's really crazy, but then themselves are pretty boring. Yeah, <laughs> you right. know? yeah well, exactly. You know, and after this podcast, I think I'm going to go back and reread some of this stuff now that I know a little bit about the man behind the, the stories and his experiences and, and what he went through. So uh, honestly, it makes me so happy to hear you say that. I'm always an advocate for people reading more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't happen as much nowadays because yeah. of, um, well, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but it's easier to watch a movie than to read a book. Absolutely. Which is fine. That is what it is. Yeah. Um, anyways, well, I hope you enjoyed this. I, I did. And hey, I want to say thank you very much for having me on. Of course. Thank you for wanting to come on. Uh, absolutely. And um, I think your podcast is very interesting. You always pick interesting subjects. Oh, and, thank uh, you. I was honored to be on it. So thank awesome. you, Jacob. Awesome. Hey, well, if you ever want to come back, feel free to <laughs> drop me an email or whatever and be more than happy. That sounds great, buddy. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Before we sign off, uh, one last thing. I want to tease our next episode oh, that okay, we're going to yeah. do. So next time, uh, it's going to be not a person just because they're not easy, but relatively more simple. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite American writers, Thomas Paine. Uh, and that's going to be real fun, real exciting. I have a lot of... Um, fun stuff to dive into uh-huh. so our audience can look forward to that but until then i hope you guys have a great day i hope this was entertaining and uh yeah we'll see you next week take care guys bye-bye confucius once said study the past if you would define the future you've been listening to the history slices podcast with jacob and rachel We hope you've gotten some useful information from the show. We hope we made you think, and we hope you were entertained. We know we had fun, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on Facebook at History Slices and on Instagram at History Slices Podcast. Make sure to like, rate, and review the show, and tell a friend about the show. That'll help us out, too. One more quote before we go from Michael Crichton. If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. Till next time, this is History Slices, signing off.